The second thing a would-be despot always does is to create a secret prison system where torture takes place that is outside the rule of law. And very often, they will also establish military tribunals that strip prisoners of due process. Okay, let me interject something right here. This is the definition of a military tribunal. Take it from Wikipedia, as you can see, I'm gonna read it. Military tribunals in the United States. Military tribunals in the United States are military courts designed to try members of enemy forces during wartime. Now, you might know that we get dealt with according to the Trading with the Enemy Act. And they treat us like enemy combatants anytime we want to uphold the Constitution. I don't care if it's the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of the United States of America, whatever you want to call it. Anytime we want to uphold the Constitution, we're treated like enemy combatants. And there's a war time. It's during, dealing with the fact that they've declared war against drugs and uh, a couple other things. But anyway, that can be considered a wartime situation, especially now with, with this uh, coronavirus. They're talking about front lines, and they're using all of these terms that you use in the military when you're dealing with a front, with, with a combatant or with an enemy, and you're on the front lines uh, confronting this enemy face to face. So they've actually declared war uh, against a uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 or whichever one you want to call it, and they use all of these terms associated with war. They've even instituted some acts to to uh, enlist some uh, so-called private corporations to make masks and ventilators and all this other type of stuff to let you know that we're dealing with a wartime situation. So anytime you're dealing with a wartime situation, you deal with a military tribunal. But this wartime situation has been going on long before COVID-19. Anyway, let me continue operating outside the scope of conventional criminal and civil proceedings. I'm very familiar with the United States operating outside of conventional criminal and civil proceedings. In the United States District Court, they totally violate any right that you th thought that you ever had. And due process is the main thing that they violate. They do the same thing in the civil cases. They don't violate, uh, they don't honor your due process. So these military tribunals have been in existence in the United States. It's just that most people don't see what's going on in these courts because they use lawyers. And lawyers is there to be a buffer between you knowing what's going on and the court uh, exposing itself. But I can tell you from my firsthand experience that all of these courts are dealing with uh, military tribunals because they all fly the military flag which is a red, white, and blue flag with the gold fringe around it. That's a military martial law flag. Anyway, as we continue, the judges are military officers and fulfill the role of jurors. So these judges, the military officers, f fulfill the role of, ju of jurors. In the United States District Court, you can experience this also. They'll tell you that you've been indicted by a grand jury, this, that, and the other. But when you do some research, you'll find out that a single judge can be a grand jury. How about that? Anyway, military tribunals are, are distinct from courts martial. The military tribunal is an inquisitorial system based on charges brought by military authorities. The military authority in the United States District Court is the United States because the United States is a military corporation. You should be able to tell that because it's a corporation, in, uh, in case you didn't know, and corporations always have a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Matter of fact, 
one of the titles of the president of the United States is commander in chief. Anyway, let me continue. Prosecuted by a military authority, judged by military officers, and sentenced by a military officer against a member of an enemy army. Anytime you uphold the Constitution, you consider it a member of an enemy army because to the United States Corporation, which is a democracy or democracy, they don't operate according to any type of republic form of government, which the Constitution was based on a republic. Don't take my word for it. Do your own research. Anyway, the United States has made use of military tribunals or commissions. I had to deal with a commission NUR, when I was dealing with a state court in Arizona. I had to deal with not a judge. He called, they, his title was commissioner. So therefore, he had to receive a commission. Right? So it was commission that I had to deal with. And this was supposed to be a regular civil court. But of course, it was a court martial. It was a military tribunal. Anyway, rather than rely on a court martial within the military justice system during times of declared war or rebellion, most recently, as discussed below, which I'm not going to read, the administration of George W. Bush sought to use military tribunals to try unlawful enemy combatants. Again, any time you want to uphold the Constitution in any United States court, you're considered to be an enemy combatant. If that's not the case, then why, according to Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the Constitution, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. But everybody listening to my voice right now is paying debts using Federal Reserve notes. If it was a, a constitutional a country, then we could only pay a debt with gold and silver coin, which is still the case. But you won't find them upholding that in these unconstitutional courts. Anyway, let me continue. Most individuals captured abroad, you're considered a foreigner to the United States. Just like Arizona is a corporation, Illinois is a corporation, California, so forth and so on, all our corporations. One corporation is foreign to another corporation. Corporations usually have a different agenda and a different set of rules that their members or their stockholders have to operate according to. So that's what we're dealing with. We, anytime you're dealing with the United States, you're being considered a foreigner, even though you might call yourself a citizen. Either way, you will find if you examine for yourself that your rights will be violated because it's my firm belief that we've been under martial law for a long time. And the problem is that people don't know what martial law is. Again, Lenin was the innovator this time, but Mussolini studied Lenin and developed his system called Confino. Hitler studied Stalin and developed the people's court system. I beg your pardon, Hitler studied Mussolini with the people's court system and Stalin studied Hitler. And so what happens when you have a military tribunal system and a secret prison system outside the rule of law where torture takes place is that it starts to put pressure on the rest of civil society. And I'll tell you how. Now this is really difficult. But this is like, I've started to like offer $50,000 for anyone who can do this, even though I don't happen to have $50,000 handy. But um, I invite you to name a society that created a secret prison system outside the rule of law where torture takes place that didn't sooner or later turn the abuse against its own citizens. So why should we worry about the fact that brown people with Muslim names on this far-off island are being tortured. 
The White House says we don't torture. It's a lie. They're being tortured systemically. People in US-held prisons in Iraq are being tortured. People at black sites are being tortured. Why should it bother us? I mean, apart, I mean, my brother's a really decent guy. But he said, you know, that's not my issue before he read my argument. And so apart from the moral issue, why should we worry that the state has legalized torture? The reason we should worry is that in what I call a fascist shift, and I use that term very conservatively, I use it technically, not rhetorically. I, there are many definitions of fascism. My dictionary definition is when the state starts to use terror against the individual in an effort to push back democracy. So we should worry about the fact that the state has essentially legalized torture of these marginal people, people who are marginal to us, because what always happens in a fascist shift is that the state will start by abusing people that no one in the mainstream really identifies with much. You know, in, in Germany, it was anarchists, communists, homosexuals, Jews, gypsies, thank you. And then what always happens is there's a blurring of the line and the, the, the news starts to catch up more and more members of civil society, mainstream society, and it's always the same cast of characters. Us, basically. Um, journalists, editors, opposition leaders, labor leaders, and outspoken clergy. So, we sh you know, and, and Germany is so instructive in this regard because, you know, people don't realize that it didn't start with crematoria. You know, that what happens when you create a secret prison system where torture takes place is it always metastasizes, starts out little and informal and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And like in, in Berlin in 1931, 1932, torture was still illegal. The Nazis weren't even in power. They were a minority uh, party. It was still a democracy. There were opposition, there were marches, there was, you know, everything was, was as it, it should have been. But the SA, a paramilitary force, we'll get to that, started to create these makeshift torture cellars where they would torment these marginal people. And everyone knew about it. They thought it was funny. There were cartoons about it in the German press. It's like, you know, that show 24. It's like, that's funny. Everyone accepted it. But then it doesn't take too long before the line starts to be blurred. So why is this so urgently relevant to us? Most Americans don't realize that the president now claims the power to say to any one of us, what's your name? Raul. Raul, you're an enemy combatant. Or let's find someone who really looks like a soccer mom, a Republican soccer mom, okay? <laughs> I, I, Republican, you have a really nice purse. Republican soccer mom. Yes, yes. Pardon me? Anne, enemy combatant. No, it doesn't matter. You can be innocent. You can be Republican. You can be a devoted, you know, evangelical. It doesn't matter. Enemy combatant is a status offense. Your innocence does not protect you. Your party affiliation does not protect you. And if he says, and Naomi, enemy combatant, it's like mother may I. If he, on his say-so alone, he can name you or me an enemy combatant, and they can't torture us yet, but they can take us to a Navy brig to a 10 by 12 foot cell and keep us in sol American citizens, innocent American citizens, in solitary confinement. If you haven't watched part one of The End of America yet, I suggest you do that. Then come back to my page for part three. Peace.